Enemy and feminism hand in hand have dipped <laughs> modern women of the truth that motherhood is a high and beautiful calling to be pursued. Even pagan women who finally, after many years probably, decided to have kids have said things like, why did everybody tell me it was going to be so awful? My child is the best thing that's ever happened to me. About it before, you can do all the right trad wife house make homemaking aesthetic and have a rotten, rotten heart. Shalom, shalom. I hope you're all doing well. This video, I have so many feelings and I don't know if I can articulate all of this. I'll do my best. This is a very small podcast. The channel only has like 100 something subscribers. It doesn't have that many downloads. It's a podcast and a YouTube channel. And it's typical fundy stuff. Uh, young and wifed up. Wifed up. Wow, there's a very old timely term. I'm very surprised. I kind of just out of curiosity listened to it and then I couldn't stop listening to it because these two hosts, Marcella and Gabby, their sisters, they are honestly very dangerous and I'm horrified by what I listen to. Um, I tried to watch the YouTube channel, but I watched it at work and so I couldn't really like, I could only really listen to it. I wasn't able to like watch it. So it was a little difficult for me to tell who was talking. So at times I couldn't really tell if it was Marcella or Gabby talking since they sound so similar and it was hard to keep track. But either way, I got plenty of their message and I'm stunned, horrified, and saddened. I can easily say I think this is the worst trad wife content on the internet right now. Perhaps a little bit worse than that viral article on Ballerina Farm. If not worse than that, uh, because these two women, they have not punished their bodies as much as Hannah Nealman has. Definitely, I can see their logic being what Hannah uses to justify her life to herself. And that's the thing, the logic. Because their interpretation of Bible quotes, the way they explain what it is to be a biblical woman and to be a trad wife and to be submissive and all that stuff that we've come to know trad wives for— is some of the most dangerous content about relationships and marriage I've ever consumed. And their rhetoric is the perfect blueprint for how an abusive husband can gaslight his wife, or how a trad wife, submissive wife, biblical Christian wife can gaslight herself into staying in a horrible relationship. And that's really what I'm focusing on. Their, their content expands a lot of different topics. This podcast was started in 2020, and they've been uploading episodes semi-regularly since 2020. I'll say right now, I have not re listened to all of the episodes. Um, that's going to take a very, very long time. So that's why this video is going to be in parts, um, just because I want to be able to get out my thoughts while it's still fresh in my head. So I focused on the videos about relationships, and uh, this is so scary. And I do think a lot of Christians, even fundamentalist Christians, would disagree with them. And I am so saddened. So I'm going to go through and I'm going to break down everything that I watched and give my counterpoints. Also... Again, I have not listened to all the episodes, so I can't be certain. Um, I'm pretty sure they either got more or just became more open about their fundamentalism more recently because of the explosion of trad wife content on TikTok. Because the early podcast episodes for like the first two years from 2020 to 2022 were very uh, banal topics, just basically housekeeping, how to run a home, be a homemaker, that kind of stuff. They only got more serious about relationships and family planning and biblical submission womanhood relatively recently. And I think that's just because, again, of Tried Wife TikTok. So without any further ado, let's go into all the key videos that expose their darkest views on relationships. So this video called Natural Family Planning, it's an interview with with a lady named Shannon. As the time of recording the video, Shannon, their guest on the podcast, is 18 weeks pregnant with child number five. The oldest child is six, so she's always basically been pregnant. And Marcella and Gabby talked to Shannon about health issues regarding reproduction 
And Shannon is kind of like a bit of an expert on reproduction, gives advice, but she is not a doctor and they don't at all say anything about seeing a doctor. Shannon seems to have no higher education in health or fertility. She's just self-taught. And then they say that natural fertility methods should be taught in high school. So how to get pregnant as quick as possible immediately, not, of course, birth control. Fertility awareness method um, is something that we can teach young women when they're in high school and young adolescents, correct? Yes. Um, but we would practice natural family planning when a woman is married. Yes. Yeah, right. because there are benefits to knowing our bodies that mm -hmm. don't have to do with conceiving or not conceiving children. Absolutely. It's just yeah. general knowledge. I mean, if I had known any of this, even just a tiny bit of it, I wouldn't have been surprised when I wasn't pregnant. A month yeah. after crying. You know what I mean? Because I would have known. I honestly thought you could get pregnant literally at any time. <laughs> right. I and mean, that's a that's a huge misconception yeah, that like, yeah, you can get pregnant at any time. And so you either need to be on the pill or or use other types of contraceptives mm -hmm. at all times. And there's no other way because you're at risk at getting pregnant. So yes, teenagers just need to get pregnant ASAP, like right now, like get pregnant as young as possible. They're so obsessed with having a baby that they're giving advice how to get pregnant on the wedding day. So Geez, not even time to enjoy the honeymoon. Yeah. Having an irregular cycle points to disorder. Even if it's just something as minor as stress, my cycle was pushed back on my wedding day because I was so stressed out that week. Wow, wow. yeah. <laughs> it can be something as small as stress that's going to go away the next day or the next week. Mm -hmm. Or it can yeah. be something um, a little more serious like low progesterone, high estrogen, luteal phase defect, uh, thyroid disorders, and PCOS. And so um, just from a medical standpoint, as someone who goes to the doctor, not a doctor, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I go to a, the doctor a lot and it was very eye-opening for me to just randomly ask her like, hey, my temps are really low. And she's like, oh, that's very common with hypothyroidism. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, really? And then when I talked, when I was giving some back history about that. And they use fear tactics against birth control. Their logic is very messed up. They say, well, birth control doesn't work all the time. So why even bother at all? So it's like, there's no point in really trusting birth control since it's not 100% safe. No, it's just 99.999% safe. And they go after all forms of birth control. The morning after pill, getting tubes tied, condoms, everything. Like, they say, well, there's no way you can ever really prevent a pregnancy unless you get your um, uterus removed. So don't even bother trying at all, period. Just get pregnant. And of course, well, there is a 100% perfect method to not getting pregnant. And of course, it's abstinence. Abstaining from sex is the only way to prevent pregnancy. Even now, it's a much lower chance than probably this is. But mm. yeah, abstaining really is the only way um, 100%. Right. But in the marriage context, that uh, would not. Is, that's not a thing. <laughs> not a thing. Yeah. Right. Right. For a time of prayer and fasting. Yeah. Um, so. So, so yeah, I don't have any, it, any statistical facts, but I'm sure if you really needed to know that you could dig into that on the Internet and find, find something or in yes. some of the books that I'll be recommending. Mm, awesome. Um, might have them but so you've mentioned before that there are some people like myself that have um uh, hormonal disorders um and so for somebody like me or for another woman that has maybe um like you said different there's a whole slew of different types of of issues from hypothyroidism to endometriosis to even just like but of course if you happen to have sex then you shouldn't be on birth control trying to prevent it even if you don't want the baby. Like, they're trying to frame having a baby as the most inevitable thing possible for a woman. So any way to try to delay that is just useless and shouldn't even be a thought. In the next video titled One by Her Conduct, this, I, I think, is about a husband cheating, but they don't say that. They use flowery-coded language, and I don't know why, so because they talk about husbands not being Christian and use a lot of allegories, but I 
don't really know exactly what they mean. So I, I think it's about cheating. They talk about husband not showing fruit as a Christian. I think fruit meaning sex. Then like in this video, their guest alludes that her husband was unfaithful for eight years. So when it comes to encouragement, I think we tend towards focusing on what's going to make the person feel a certain way. And as much as I want to do that, because I know um, just <clears throat> on the front end, I'm going to tell my story a little bit later, but I was unequally yoked in my marriage for eight years. I incited by anything that you hear come out of his mouth, any of his behavior. Um, I believe that God tells us these things in part so that we'll know where we could have been or where we came from. And we also have to remember this is our natural state apart from the Holy Spirit, but also so that when we see unbelievers acting like unbelievers, we don't waste our time in shock. Right. And, and being emotionally crippled by that, because in your marriage, one thing that it's going to be really important to do is to be in control of yourself and not be reacting. Again, does anyone else see that as cheating? I mean, maybe if it wasn't cheating, then for eight years, they fundamentally had a lot of serious issues in their marriage. But of course, that's just something she just like I put up with. Like really, eight years of misery in a marriage is totally fine to stick it out. And again, I think they mean sex because in, see, the vague language is so hard because in this clip, you can't change your husband's heart. You can't cause him um, to be regenerate <laughs> by your own sheer force of will. What is regenerative? I think that also means sex, but I'm not really sure. And then when they actually do talk about like actual conflict in marriage, if you and your husband disagrees, just accept it because that's just how he is. So, you know, you can't do anything about it. Hostile to his law and he, your husband cannot feel differently apart from God's intervention. So when you're going into conversations with your husband or anything spiritual comes up, or even, you know, as a side, he sees you living a Christian life and he is responding negatively towards that. Don't be surprised by it. He's, he's responding the way that he, he is in the flesh. Um, and that goes to my next point. And hopefully this is a little more, a little more hopeful. Don't look to externals to predict the fate of your husband. Um, the Lord can save him in an instant. Yes. Um, so I think we can tend to think of the unbeliever as being on this spectrum of like having a soft heart or having a hard heart, but that's not how scripture talks about an unbeliever. It says that the unbeliever is either spiritually dead or spiritually, spiritually alive. So I think we can kind of get tied up in this cycle of like looking for all of these external evidences that God might be doing something. And in a way that's good to do, but in a way that can kind of, uh, cause us to be tossed about hmm. it can also cause us to look at a husband and their logic makes it seem like the husband can be fixed to be improved but in reality what they're actually saying is nah he's just is that way so you know what don't even bother trying to fix him or change him just put up with it because he's your husband look at a husband who seems to have a very hard heart and a very angry disposition and say well, he's so far. I just can't see mm -hmm. how it's possible. But honestly, it's just as impossible, even if he were like, I don't know, more laid back and casual. And like, you could yeah. be very warm towards the faith and still be impossibly far from coming yeah. to faith. So um, the, the hope in that is that it's never, he's never too far. There's never a day that your head should hit the pillow that you should say, well, definitely not tomorrow because you mm. have no idea. Um, so that that's the next. And then the verse I had there was just Ephesians 2, 1, where it says you were dead in trespasses and sins. There are a lot of verses here, but I'm not going to go too long. <laughs> but um, yeah. <clears throat> so the next piece of encouragement is if Christ has died to purchase your husband, he will not be lost. So, I mean, okay, John 6, 36 through 40. All that the father gives me will come to me and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out for I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my father, that everyone who looks on. They say a lot of other strange things like destiny and, and she saw her husband in her destiny as preset to be this way. So 
if it looks like he's struggling with the devil, which I can only interpret as it cheating or just being a bad person, don't worry because God gave him to you. So that means that he's destined to have it work out some way. So just wait it out and hope it'll be for the better. And just when hearing that, it, I think like, so if he hits you, don't do anything about it because it was his destiny to hit you and eventually it'll be his destiny to get better how? Because God will will it. And if he doesn't get better, that means God is punishing you if you have to accept it. Again, their logic for just sitting back and accepting however your husband might be, whatever bad behavior, is very, like, ominous. They allude to an answer like, nothing you can do can make your husband lose his salvation. So whatever he does to you that might be bad, don't worry, he's saved. And so it'll be fine in the end. Because whatever he might do, the biggest concern you should have is whether he's saved or not, and he is. So don't be worried about anything, how you feel about anything he did to you. Salvation, that's a message. Those are words. Um, So I'm not saying this because there's nothing you can do about it. I'm saying this because there's nothing you can do to cause your husband to lose his salvation. Yeah. There's no way that you can fall short in your witness, in your conduct, in, you know, I think. Um, especially in my early marriage with my husband and I being unequally yoked, I had so much of a burden on myself to say the right thing or to do the right thing. And literally Mm -hmm. I was in tears all the time thinking I blew it. Like, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, I, I, I'm not doing what I should. And oh my gosh, he's just, you know, that's not how it works. So right. There's peace in that. There's peace in that. Yes, absolutely. Um, It's not a, you know, so you can be complacent. You don't have to be obedient to scripture and nothing you do matters. But at the same time, you can't cause your husband to lose his salvation. And God is not going to lose your husband if he has chosen him. Right. And you can pray. I mean, we're encouraged. First Timothy two verses one through four. First of all, then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life. It just, again, it's nothing but having the wife blame herself for a lot of abuse and just make peace with it. Again, how fundy they are. They talk about going to evangelize the homeless. Kingdom and in Christ. That may not look like what you would like it to look like. It may not be as grand or as obvious as as you think it should be. Um, But... God has a plan and a purpose for your life, and he will not be thwarted by your husband being, you know, obstinate and crotchety, or <laughs> by you not being able to hit the streets every day to evangelize the homeless or whatever. Evangelize, like pray for them. How about give them food if you're going to be out there talking to them? They do address head on what if you're having really bad issues with your spouse. And the answer is, well, we're all sinners and you're a sinner. So don't be judgmental when you know you're just as bad anyway. We're still sinners. (laughs) We're just safe sinners. Mm -hmm. Um, And I feel like that's a really big thing, especially in believing with believing spouses. They tend to like romanticize, oh, you know, just because we're believers and we're married, like everything's just going to be great. And that's just like not the case. So I think that that's a point that we we really tend to forget. no. Also, in like a backwards way, I guess, encouraging to people who do have unbelieving spouses, because it's not for the bigger picture, it's not for the sake of, you know, making everything better, you know, surface level of what's going on in their soul. So I, I really appreciate you saying that. Good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think it's happened even to, to Ryan and I, where somebody was speaking to us. I mean, I think it's happened a few times where people have been like, wow, like your husband, he just like reads his Bible so much and he's so involved spirit. So again, this logic, if he hits you, well, the wife was a sinner anyway. So that's like saying she deserved it because you were bad anyway. So even if he hit you for a different reason, you probably have something worth being hit for anyway. And again, this clip about them addressing doubts in the marriage I take it as being code for abuse. And again, it's very much just find a way to make peace with it. Tough it out. Tough toenail. About a year into my marriage, it really started to hit me. Um, 
the implications of the decision that I made, because even though everything is wonderful, how, how quickly can things change in a relationship? You know what I mean? Um, what did I sign myself up for in regards to, I start thinking about what are the implications for us having children together? What have I done in the lives of my children? What have I done as far as limiting myself? If Ryan chooses to be obstinate, like or to hold me back? What have I done to limit myself in regards to my ability to serve the Lord? And so there was like a solid year where I just grieved and repented and just felt this immense Mm -hmm. sorrow, not because of what I was going through, like not because anything was wrong with my relationship with Ryan, but it was very God word. It was very like directed towards the Lord and like repenting because I was like, wow, have I... (laughs) Have I really like, you know, kind of stuck my feet to the ship and I don't have much control over where it's going? You know, I I really like not only that, I knew where it was going and I got on it and it was going away from the Lord. <laughs> so it's just. Oh, and if you really need help, go to the elders in the church, not therapy. And honestly, that to me just seems like, again, a form of brainwashing because the older generation who were around before the feminist movement will be like, well, you know what? I took beatings from my husband, so you can too. So there you go. In his hostility towards God to go to church with me and stand up there and allow my daughter to be baptized, knowing what it meant. Mm. is just like, how wonderful is God? Yeah. that It's crazy to me still thinking yeah. about it, but. Yeah. And then about when I was like 31 or 32, so about three and a half years ago, Ryan and I just went through a really hard season in our marriage. Um, Both of us just got in over our heads on some issues that we were dealing with and had to bring the elders in uh, to work through it. And so not only have I had an unbelieving husband, but I have had the experience of like bringing elders in to counsel both of us, um, yeah. in spite of the fact that my husband was not a believer and did not see himself as needing to submit to the authority of the eldership. So, right. yeah, but by God's grace, my pastor <laughs> came in and was kind of like, had this conversation with my husband where he was. Would- as the video goes on, they do go into more specific examples of conflicts in the home. And the answer is, of course, self-gaslight. Like, be careful not to be too pushy and don't dare call your husband pushy or accuse of him being pushy at all. It was authentic because, and I think we'll talk about this later, but I've just been really careful not to push anything. And even when we were going through what we were going through, I didn't say this is how you save our marriage is by becoming a believer because I didn't ever want it to be uh, do this hey, for me. Do this yeah, for us. I didn't want it. I wanted, yeah. I didn't ever want it to be a um, condition. You know what I mean? Because I entered into the marriage willingly knowing that he was an unbeliever and I didn't ever want to feel like, well, maybe he did it just for appearances or because mm-hmm. I put the pressure on or anything like that. And so just seeing the growth in him and his like desire to get us to church every Sunday and to be the one when I'm like, I'm really tired. I don't know if I can, if I can manage four kids in a service. And he's like, no, let's go. You know, like to have my husband be that person is nuts to me. Like to see him reading his Bible on his own at times is just like mind blowing because I know where he came from. Yeah. And yeah. Wow. Praise God. Thank you for sharing your story with us, Ash. And your experience is valuable to this episode and it's I'm sure you've been able to bless so many other women just even like one-on-one um with you know how the Lord has brought you and your husband like first like every every salvation is a miracle and again how low the bar is there's this clip where one of them talks about how her husband started reading the Bible on his own and she was so amazed by this it's in a service and he's like no let's go You know, like to have my husband be that person is nuts to me. Like to see him reading his Bible on his own at times is just like mind blowing because I know where he came from. Yeah. And yeah. Wow. Praise God. Thank you for sharing your story with us, Ash. And your experience is valuable to this episode. And it's, I'm sure you've been able to bless so many other women, just even like one on one. Um, with, 
you know, how the Lord has brought you and your husband, like first, like every, every salvation is a miracle. We believe that, but just hearing sometimes we we forget and we take for granted the, just the beauty of salvation. And sometimes we just need a reminder. And so that was, that's, it was very encouraging to hear. Um, I have a couple questions regarding some practical ways that a woman in this position um, can handle her day-to-day life. The first question would be, how is she? But my thing is, if both of them were always Christian and very devoted Christians when they got married, shouldn't him reading the Bible on his own be the basic expectation? Why after marriage, when both of you were always very devout Christians, or at least she was, would suddenly him progressing to reading the Bible every now and then on his own be this miraculous thing? So they have a part two to the one by her conduct title video. I don't even like that title. And again, all of it is basically shaming a woman if she dares has an issue with their husband, legitimate or not. I mean, no complaint is legitimate for a woman to have for them. Like they say, try convincing him without using your words. Make sure you don't get upset, even if his reasons are valid, because that's going to make it worse. And how dare you make your husband feel like he's not doing good. Concept a little bit more. So Mm -hmm. does that mean we never share the gospel with them? We never bring our, our concerns to them regarding the things that you spoke about, like the preferences and sins and stuff like that. What does that mean without a word? Mm. Um, I think it is a partly how we how we conduct how we conduct ourselves um, in response to his requests. Um, mm. Yeah, I just think so much of it is in our conduct, not necessarily like I said, uh, ticking all the check boxes and being like. I don't even know. I can't even think of an example right now. Like another thing about how below the bar is for the husband, both the spouses are supposed to be Christian, yet they also discourage any woman from using the Bible or Bible quotes to address any criticism because that's not approaching the husband with sensitivity. Um, I think it's, I think it's a, a Proverbs or see now I'm going to start quoting scripture that I don't have written down, oh, but no. <laughs> which is so horrible. This, this is why I write stuff down. Um, cause I have four kids and they took all my brains. <laughs> um, but you know, the law of the Lord is perfect. Reviving the soul hmm. it's somewhere in Proverbs or in Psalms. I don't remember which one. Um, is it in some yeah it's one of our songs right well i'm also we're in song right now like i was like i'm a also, song <laughs> i'm also um singing proverbs 25 with the kids in our homeschool and i cannot i just couldn't remember where I, that was placed but it's so uh cool. yeah so <laughs> so anyway so yeah um you know in romans even talks about like how can people be saved if they do not hear the word so um but I don't think we have to be preachy about it. I don't think we're going to like, you're going to sit down and listen. I'm going to read the Bible to the kids, but you're also going to hear what I have to say. Yeah. Um, yeah. Or passive aggressively <laughs> reading super loud. And of course, they assume all women are nags, of course. Nag, nag, nag. Him over. Because it's also not a matter of him just hearing it 17 times. And on the 17th time, it'll click. The Lord was just waiting for you to say it one more time. Yeah. That's not, <laughs> that's not how that works either. So don't nag. Scripture in the Proverbs does have a lot to say about women who are dripping faucets who drive their husbands up to the rooftops with their nagging and you can say i'm not nagging but are you you are but are (laughs) Are you sure are you sure sure? i'm not Um, nagging but yeah yeah, i mean (laughs) nagging (laughs) it's not inviting him to church is not the thing that's going to save him it's a good thing to do but do you have to sweat it that he said no should you be surprised that he said no um, do you want him to act like a Christian when he's not? Right. I mean, a lot of women really just put all of their hopes and dreams on their husbands sitting in the pew and there are dead people sitting in the pews every week and they will until they die. And that's, that's very sad. And it's, I hope it's not the norm, but you know what I mean? It's, it's not enough. There has to be that regeneration. So inviting him to small groups, inviting him to church, those are good things to do in, in good moments. Like, but yeah, don't, mm-hmm. don't nag your husband. Don't, 
you know, don't try to fit him into a box that he's clearly not in because it doesn't benefit anyone. Mm -hmm. Don't expect him to act. Of course, as I said, they believe in submitting to your husband. So here's their rundown of what submission is. Leavers know what to do with that. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Like the world doesn't know what to do with that. And there's, there's, and I'll let you guys get into in your own episode, what submission looks like. But I mean, there's biblical submission, which is beautiful and strong and confident and wonderful and lovely. And then there's like the, the tropes. Right. Right. Domineering. Um, yeah, like, yeah. yeah oppressive I, submission. Can I please right. go to the bathroom? <laughs> like, yeah. you know, that's so um, just allow him to see, like, I'm submitting to you. I'm putting you in this position to lead mm-hmm. and to, to be what God has called you to be. And I'm going to, I'm here to support you in that. And I'm here to do you good and all of that. Um, that's one way just to, <laughs> to really show him, especially if, um, you know, kind of one thing I wanted to think about is like, what are you winning him to? You want to win him to Christ. You want everything that you do, everything that you say to point him to Christ. You don't want him to look at you and say, my up until this point, I thought it's a very strict code of marriage they live by. And they're very tough on how women should behave. But at least there seems to be some idea that there needs to be mutual respect then they just dive into admitting that they just have horrible double standards for men and women which i don't think is biblical at all because they say these are the christian guidelines for marriage but then they also say it's the wife's responsibility to be the holy christian one in the marriage not the husband you know you (laughs) to, to, to put it on display or you can really cultivate a relationship that just fills you to the point that you're bubbling over um, that that's what the Lord wants for you. And that's the authentic type of relationship that your husband is going to be one with, um, respect. It says in that passage that respect and chastity are the things that are going to win him over. So purity of conduct, um, that's not easy when yeah. you're, I mean, my husband has seen the most monstrous side of me, right? Nobody in the world will ever see me at that place. Right. Because you're not like, it's such an intimate relationship. Yeah. And you're it naked. Pu- and it pushes you. Yeah. Like yeah. marriage is, if nothing else, incredibly sanctifying. It is very much about your holiness and not your happiness, even though those sweet moments are there. Um, you know, so your husband is going to see you at your worst. And so it's, It's very hard to actually follow through on this, but at the same time, you have to be above reproach. And again, their justification about this is, I mean, we all heard the argument, you know, men and women are basically completely different species. They take it to a whole new level, saying God built men to thrive on respect, women on love. So you have something you want to say? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And respect, like, husbands, God built men to, you know, just thrive on respect and he built women to thrive on love. Yeah. <laughs> My husband just walked by and went like this. <laughs> but you know, um, and respect is biblically not something that you wait for your husband to earn. It's something that you show. And yes. it's not based on your husband's merit, it's based on your loyalty to Christ and yes. your lo- and your love for him and obeying his command. So um it's really important in this in this verse to respect your husband, to show your husband reverence and to, to show him that you are there for his good Mm. and that you have his good in mind in the way that you speak about him, in the way that you think about him and the way that you allow yourself to feel about him. And as women, we can get really twisted up with that. You can, you can say all the right things and you can let your mind go in really bad places about your... I know that was just a saying and they were laughing about it, but that is extremely dangerous because to at all insinuate a woman can be in a marriage without respect is so dangerous and something that in a very hostile situation, in, in an attempt to de-escalate, they might end up taking seriously. And they emphasize a woman being silent through even the hardest times. Like never bad talk your husband, even if there are obvious problems. I I have always appreciated is she never, ever trash talks him. And she could have a million things to say. 
and like, and I'm a safe person that we talk about all kinds of things together. And I have never in our, and I've known her so many years. She has never said one slanderous, gossipy thing about her husband to me. And that speaks so much volumes to her character and her respect and love for him, even though we both know that he is obstinate and hates God. And, you know, like all mm-hmm. these things, there's all this ammunition to be like, I just need to, it needs to feel good to just blah, like, let me just say it, you know? But I just, as a, somebody that's a friend in those circumstances, it it checks me. You know what I mean? Like I need to watch what I say, you know, because you, it, it, with to having that amount of self-control and that's something I'm sure she's had to practice, you know, it's not something, sometimes it's easier for others not to slander and gossip, but I just am always so thankful for that because I know that she truly respects him. And that is like so beautiful. And I pray that God blesses her obedience, you know, and it's it's interesting, too, because in these circumstances where, and again, we'll talk about this more. And even if it's hard to submit, you're doing it for God, not for your husband anyway. We're ultimately submitting and obeying to God. And so in the circumstances where even I have a really hard time submitting to my husband, I have to remind myself, like, this is me obeying God. I am obeying God by obeying him. You know what I mean? And so it's not like... You're just obeying to obey him because like he's a sinner too, you know, and it's just what God's word is true. And that's a lot of pressure to say God is constantly judging your marriage and you have to take abuse, not even for the sake of toughing it out with him, but toughing it out for God. So really, I mean, it kind of is counterintuitive to their argument saying a marriage between your and hus- you and your husband is not really about you to begin with, so why bother even being happy? It's ungodly for a woman to be demanding. He's heard you, and nagging yeah. is not going to help. So right. there's that. Um, also, I think women can really set their sights on the spiritual walk of their husband and take their eyes off of their own. And so you are like... I know I can. Also, it's a huge temptation. Uh-huh. Yeah. 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 And then you're also like looking at Becky Joe's husband and you're like, well, he leads family worship and he goes to church <laughs> early and, and, you know, unstacks the chairs every Sunday and whatever, you know, you build up this ideal. And there, there are more serious circumstances too, where a husband could be professing and could be doing all kinds of really horrible right, things. Right. And so there is a time if your husband's getting blitzed every night and still professing to be a Christian and you're worried about like his addiction or go Mm -hmm. to your elders like that's not don't wait that's not don't wait like run okay not to tattle but because like you need their support so there's there's a clear spectrum here at the same time like some women will say my husband professes to be a believer but i just don't see him in prayer and in the word and that is way more common than the alternative right and in those instances it's a little more nuanced and hard But of course, the natural implication from that is it's not ungodly for a man to be demanding. And again, they give so many examples and backups of what to do in hostile situations. And all of it is just basically coded for you should take it using very twisted logic and very strange interpretations of the Bible, like what to do if your husband is blitzed. Right. And so there is a time if your husband's getting blitzed every night. And still professing to be a Christian and you're worried about like his addiction or go Mm -hmm. to your elders. Like that's not, don't wait, that's not, don't wait, like run. Okay. Not to tattle, but because like you need their support. So there's, there's a clear spectrum here at the same time. Like some women will say, my husband professes to be a believer, but I just don't see him in prayer and in the word. And that is way more common than the alternative. Right. And in those instances, it's a little more nuanced and hard to, to navigate. Um, but I would just say, take your eyes off your husband enough to look at your own, your mm-hmm. own self and trust the Holy spirit, like the fruit of the spirit. You don't see him bearing fruit. Well, who's, whose responsibility is that? Is your husband just going to think real hard and it's going to happen. Like, you know, (laughs) I don't know. It's, and you know, sanctification is synergistic. Like we, you know, we need to pursue holiness. So it is your husband's responsibility, of course, but like, um, and this is what the pastor's wife of their church says. I shared the story 
uh, this lady who I just adore so much. She's a pastor's wife, just speaking kind correction. I was venting to her about somebody who was really annoying me. It was not my husband. It was somebody else. (laughs) (laughs) And she just looked at me and was like, tell me something good about this person. And right then and there, I knew I had crossed a line and I had sinned Mm -hmm. and I had gossiped. And so we can slander and we said, and we can gossip about our husbands. Um, It's not something that we think about. I know I, you know, I didn't used to think about talking about imperfections and not what it is. It's slanderous. It's gossip. It's, you know, breaking the ninth commandment. Um, So it's something that is, it is a sin um, that we need to be corrected on and admonished gently by older women. Um, so yeah, uh, let's see, Ash, do you have anything to, uh, I'm sure you do. What am I talking about? <laughs> when do I you not ask? Is that even a talk question? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think it's important to remember that the Titus in the next video called singleness, reflection and regrets. Basically it's why you, them having been single for a moment is a bad idea. It really plays into the previous video's themes of submissions for the simple matter that why even bother a woman bother to want anything when she's just going to end up having to give it all up anyway for their husband, which is exactly what happened to them. Actually, during this podcast, one of them was a piano teacher, but she gave it up eventually because she was wanting to focus more on her home and husband. So one of them admits she decided to get married young after being ambitious, but she said being ambitious made her feel confused about her relationship and marriage because she wanted friends, but she didn't get to have real friends because she restrained herself because she eventually knew that she would have to focus on her husband fully anyway. So she never gave herself the chance to branch out. Do something, new. And that's one of the reasons why Judd and I decided to get married so young. Yeah. Um, was kind of like, kind of out of left field, I think, for a lot of people who knew me. I was very, like, career-minded and oriented out of high school. I feel like I had a fairly lucrative um, career in music at the time. I could have gone really far with it. I was Mm -hmm. auditioning for schools and like, or preparing for auditioning for, um, conservatories and stuff like that. Um, and then the Lord just put on my heart to wait and to just teach for a while and to work and just kind of like continue what I was doing to kind of stay in town, to, um, stay living with my parents. And then I met Jed and then I was like, Oh, Okay, (laughs) this kind of makes sense now. Um, Also, just like people who are discontent and things Mm -hmm. like that, and the list goes on. But um, yeah, like I wish at that time, and that's not to say the things that I was pursuing were bad in themselves, but I think I would have, I would have rather if I could go back. um, And then this is them on what it means to give up a career. Itself is bad. But in comparison to what I could have been doing, I could have, you know, reprioritized for sure. Yeah, you could have had more balance. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And that's one thing that I kind of like had to fight for in conversations was like, well, why don't you just like go to school? Like you have so much natural talent at this. Like it's going to be wasted away on what? You're going to get married young, have kids and then what? Like, yeah, for what, family life? Like, that seems kind of silly. You have this, like, big thing going for you and whatever. Again, a lot of their whole take on singleness and living your life and doing what you want to do is just, why bother doing it when God is calling you to get married and make a home anyway? So everything that other women do, like college loan debts and education and degrees and careers, is useless and pointless. Really thrive in and be really successful and make a lot of money and like connections and like doing all this stuff. And I was on the road to doing that, but I just like, there's like something in the back of my mind, like, I just don't think I'm going to be doing it for very long. So why would I invest, you know, all this time and money, accrue a ton of debt from going to school, <laughs> yeah. only to know that this is really what I was, that what uh, the life that I was called to do. Um, 
And and yeah, that's like a, a really big thing that I wish I could have told myself when I was single. And then along with that, like finding a godly mentor, that is something I had been missing out on a lot. I definitely had mentors, right? but it was a lot of, um, like I was saying, prioritizing the career aspect of my life not the spiritual or balance, um, work-life balance in my life that I needed. Um, and it was hard because these are, you know, they were people that were very, um, I don't even know what the word is. It's like you want to do right by them or like you want to, you, you want to like please you them. them or, yeah. yeah, you like you, you feel like you... Like they shame any women for wanting something for themselves, really anything. And they like to spin it like they were in the position of many feminists, so they know what it's like and it's overrated anyway. They also, this is them talking about how long they were single when they got, until they got married out of high school. Third one. <laughs> we'll That's do. totally fine. We'll do. So I think my list is a little bit more exhaustive just because I was single for a lot longer. <laughs> That's true. I didn't have very much time to. Yeah. Well, make so how? Being so from the time you graduated high school to the time you got married, how many years is that for you? Mm. Mm. Please hold. <laughs> Three years. Okay. Yeah. So minus double, minus six. <laughs> So I, so just to give you guys a little bit of perspective. So my, Marcella never left the home. You were under my no. father's covering for, which your, I'm very grateful yes. for. Yes. And very honestly, I, one of the things that I wish that I had done is stayed under my father's covering. And again, like, I'm not going to say I don't have regrets. The whole, the whole no regrets thing is stupid like that's not oh no i regret so that's, many things that's that. not that's not even like christian no. like we're not supposed to look back on our life and say no regrets you know what i mean we should look back on our mm -hmm. life and see how again they talk about them coming from a place of like they know what it's like to be an ambitious career woman i'm like they never got a chance to even start a career they barely had any like they always had basic jobs they never got a chance to work their way up in anything, unless it was church related. And another thing I wonder, because they use this weird language of fathers calling them back, and it, I don't really know what it means, but I wonder if their dad was maybe getting worried they were becoming too secular, living on their own and working and not getting married and starting a family. So I guess maybe he started to shame them, saying they were not Christian enough. I'm not really sure. Left. Um, my, my, my father's covering when I was 17, I was newly 17 and I graduated high school and I had a plan. I moved to LA. Um, I was a part of a ministry school. Um, at the time my family was in Pentecostalism and I, and I went to a Pentecostal ministry school, um, in downtown LA and I lived there for three, uh, almost three years, not quite three years, but, um, almost three years. I was thrusted into a leadership role while I was there very quickly and so my spiritual journey, honestly, like it's, it's so shameful and chaotic and crazy. And, and uh, it wasn't until I was back under my father's covering when I was mm. about to be 20, um, that my, the Lord, um, graciously saved me and regenerated me and woke me up to the wretched, sinful person that I am. And so it's so interesting how like leaving the home, like it, it actually Lisa, like, so again, this clip makes me really worried about what influence their father had when they were well into adulthood back under the covering of my father and his rules which were very difficult for me as a wo young woman who had kind of found her independence you know and i was so used to having my own way and nobody you know not having to answer to really anybody mm -hmm. and so it was really difficult for me um but you know the lord was gracious in that too as he as the lord sanctified me in my um early salvation um he also, you know, restored the relationship with my parents, you know, and there was so much goodness, you know, I was able to rebuild my life. I was able to, you know, get some good jobs and, um, you know, find a good church, you know, where I eventually met my husband, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of really, um, good things that the Lord has, has given me when I look back on my singlehood, but these are the things that I wish I would have done differently. 
<laughs> so the first thing is I wish I could tell myself, um, young Gabby, if you're listening, <laughs> every second of the day doesn't need to be filled with work or activities. Um, this, because I think I had six years of bad habits to accrue. <laughs> in the episode, one of them talks about going to a private Christian college in downtown Los Angeles. I don't live in Los Angeles, but I'm very familiar with downtown Los Angeles. And I thought I knew what school they went to. When they said Christian school in Los Angeles, the most famous one is Biola University, which is not in downtown Los Angeles, though I do think they have like a, a satellite campus, but they are pretty close to Los Angeles. So I thought maybe they were just slightly misremembering the location, but I thought I knew. And Biola University is a very heavy evangelical Christian university, but it is a legit university that is actually very good in education and they have very high ranking degrees. But then I looked into it more and I think more likely they went, put it in nice words, a completely scam college. They actually were going to school right in downtown Los Angeles. It was likely World Mission University, which I did not hear about before um, up until researching for this video, even though I'm very familiar with downtown Los Angeles and I thought I knew all of the higher education institutions in that area. World Mission University has a 100% acceptance rate. I thought it was for-profit, but it seems like it's a non-profit school. And it looks like just to me a diploma mill, a place just so people can say, I got a degree um, without getting any real education, because that would be too sad. I can't be 100% sure, but it seems like it was World Mission where they went to basically a scam diploma mill school that doesn't really give a real education. And again, they go on a tirade of they don't want to feed their egos too much with other things that are not their husbands in home. Like, wow, a woman, Christian woman have pride in anything. How dare they? Oh. Yeah, I can totally... Same thing with yeah. me, too. Like, with all, like, the music stuff that I was talking about before, that was a huge thing. And even, like, a lot of the, um, like, women who were really um, huge, like, influences in my life at mm -hmm. the time, it's like, okay, maybe they wouldn't necessarily, like, self-identify, like you were saying, as, like, feminist. You don't realize how much feminism infiltrates. yeah. yeah in our in our lives in that way and yeah. it's not even necessarily like it doesn't have to be like outright like the really whoa like yeah. crazy like <laughs> yeah. feminist idea but that's yeah. like that's the seed that's where it starts yeah no so and it's and crazy it, and, and it grew like the seed that grew in me and honestly like it wasn't until i started dating ryan that i was really faced with mm -hmm. the reality of the habits that I had created because yes. by the time we were dating again I had four jobs at the time and they were all good things mm -hmm. like I was working at a crisis pregnancy center I was teaching piano like I am now I was working at a foster care agency I I was doing a working at pre oh also going back to their careers and education one of them talked about working at a crisis pregnancy center crisis pregnancy centers are fraud operations that are set up near planned parenthoods and are meant to trick people into going there for help with an unwanted pregnancy instead of going to planned parenthood to get real medical advice and potentially an abortion these crisis pregnancy centers basically just shame you for even thinking about abortion and give you a ton of false information that explains their again extent of their career and how much they know about the outside world and how they know what it's like to be a career woman and get a real education and they're like yeah overrated don't even bother one of them says that she felt like she lost her all of her 20s by trying to make it out on her own Emily's in those circumstances with the different jobs i had but I just, I wouldn't, if I could do it over again, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't. I probably would just do one or two of those things. Yeah. And been content with that, mm -hmm. you know, like pay for my gym membership, pay for my car payment, you know, pay for my basic needs. And like, we were in a place where we were living, like my dad didn't charge us rent. You know, we had rules that we had to live by, but like. Yeah. I feel like cost of living in general was. Yeah. I, I could have done it. You know, I could have done it, but yeah. to feed my and you know what it, it's now i think about it, it's so cringy like to think about it i was super proud that i was able to pay for all of our, for our wedding i paid for our whole wedding like the few family members chipped in with like certain things that were like 
like good like a uh, big costs but for the most part I paid for our wedding and I was so proud of that and now I cringe thinking about that like ew I could have like done so much more with that and like I and I'm like, she either got married either at like 23 or 26 and became a housewife and never leaves the home. I'm like, you didn't even get a chance to use your 20s as they should be. And of course, they save for their future children. They don't even want their future children even bothering to try like they did. I definitely could have applied myself to learning as a young woman, and I didn't care about it at all. And this is something that I, Lord willing, if I ever have daughters, I want to train them to be homemakers you know and like it's not that that is the only option for them like i i want to raise potential wives and husbands and mm-hmm. godly men and w- women but you know i think that it, it would be good to instill in them a love so in a video titled losing yourself which you would think would have some sympathy for christian housewives who feel lost and don't have an identity the answer is nah suck it up deal with it uh this is getting so handmaid's tale Like, they just say, you know what, it's good to deny yourself things. Outpouring of a sacrifice, a denial of comfort, um, independence, pride, and even ignorance. And although the practical application may look a little different, these principles could also apply to marriage as well. Mm. But I'm not really going to touch on that a whole lot. Um, There's a lot of confusion in this day and age regarding what real godly motherhood looks like. And... In conversations with that I've had with both sides of the spe- of the spectrum, from fellow sisters in Christ to agnostics to you know in person conversations to digital messaging and threads and things like that, I have heard the same remarks made when it comes to their personal and specific fear regarding motherhood, and it's usually I just don't want to lose myself. Now, there's a wide variety of reasons why so many women feel this way, but to me, it boils down to one connecting thought. We don't want to be expected to give something up. Let's just get used to it. Depravity is virtuous. And they say, it's fine. You gain a lot when you lose yourself in motherhood. So they actually say you should feel lost. That's a good thing. Years under my belt, um, what I have gained from losing myself in motherhood And believe it or not, the majority of those things I previously listed are, in fact, things I have personally lost. Mm. And I haven't even come close to the stage in motherhood where some would consider at the time where all the hard work, quote unquote, finally pays off. You know, you put on all the years and then finally, oh, my kids are growing up and they're Mm. going in the ways that I trained them and they're not departing from it. I am not even close to being at that point yet. And I'm already seeing the rewards that I'm reaping from it. So what has been added to my life? Um, Sanctification, first of all, integrity, patience, love, joy, fulfillment, or at least a taste of it, helpers, laughter, a better understanding of God's love for his children. And one of my favorite things is that the character challenges in daily. And again, the logic is like very ominous and very ethereal. Ethereal because they're just like, well, your soul's eternal. So what you do in this life doesn't really matter to begin with. So don't even bother to want things. We have eternal souls. Think about that. Eternal souls that we have been blessed with to steward. What are you doing with the children you've been given? Now, what does this all look like in practicality? Well, if we were to all take a decent chunk of time for some major introspection, prayer, discussion, and counsel, the answer will be different for everyone. For some of us, it may be necessary to address a sinful need for man's recognition and praise. Because let's be honest, from our culture's perspective, being a mom is, for the majority of it, an underappreciated, underrecognized, devalued, unseen, and belittled role. So some mothers may feel the need to hang on tightly to certain aspects of their life because they know they wouldn't get the appreciation or recognition they so desperately desire if they were just at home all day with their kids. Hmm. One of my favorite sections of a very beloved book, Let Me Be a Woman by Liz. They advocate for being a housewife and homemaker, but they admit like, well, what if that's just not possible? What if you need a job? If circumstances don't allow you 
you know, are you a bad Christian? They echo an argument I saw a lot of other um, Christian content makers say is just live with less. Oh, and they say your mental health is not a priority. That whatever contribution your job is making to your household is of complete necessity and you desire to be at home with your children, pray, petition the Lord to provide the necessary means to make that happen and continue to have a joyful spirit in your job. Now, a few reasons to maybe not be continuing to work. If you're, if the funds that your job is contributing to your household is by reason of funding your eating out habits or for a massive mortgage payment because you refuse to downsize and you could probably make it work if you did, um, spending money on the latest gadgets for your kids, or even this might not sit well with some of you. I've heard many women say, I have to work outside of the home for my mental health because if I'm stuck at home all day, I'm just going to go nuts. I really don't think these are legitimate reasons to continue working. Now, for those in extraordinary circumstances due to disability, single motherhood, or real financial necessity, the Lord is generously oh and again if there's strains in the marriage because of trying to be a homemaker and finances or whatever other issues just submit to his request no matter what take what he says because it'll be good for you anyway either because it's about your eternal life or you're just a better person by depriving yourself of any happiness my husband Mm. we as stay-at-home moms fight tooth and nail over our right to a break, Mm. to more sleep, to girl time, to a workout, to peace and quiet, to time to be lazy and veg out, to have our meal first, to not be touched anymore. And again, the list goes on and on and on. And I'd be lying if I said it wasn't difficult for me to shut off that twinge of jealousy or frustration when Jed would come home requesting for some time to himself after a long day at work and my thoughts immediately raced to, you got to work alone and interact with coherent adults all day. Like, why on earth would you need a break right now? Like, don't you understand that I need a break too? Yeah. I would allow my selfishness to override compassion and understanding for my husband. When parenting becomes a competition on who's got it worse, that's a huge problem. So here's my challenge to you. Do the exact... This actually reminds me, I was watching the 700 Club one time and Pat Robertson, one of the most conservative evangelical people in history, he he was doing like a submission, you know, submit question, I give advice kind of thing. And one woman said um, that her husband was irresponsible with money. He failed at many businesses and put him into debt. She inherited a lot from her dead father. And her husband says, I'm the head of the household. It's my money. You have to give that to me. But the woman was like, well, I'm afraid he's going to blow through it all. And I don't want to be in more debt. So what do I do? I want to be a godly wife, um, but I don't think he should have this money. And Pat Robertson, I guess to his credit, said, no, 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 it's your money. You do not have to give him that money at all. You are not a bad woman, a bad Christian wife for saying, no, you don't know how to handle money and and you don't deserve mine. So, okay, good for Pat Robertson there. But for these two ladies, Gabby and Marcella, they would say, oh, yes, you need to give your husband that money. Oh, you do. You are a horrible wife. You dare deprive him because you have to submit to him and whatever he wants to do, it's going to be for the good anyway, because women are just better off um, not having too much money because they'll just spend it on useless things anyway. So, you know, if someone's going to spend the money in a useless way, it's better he than you. And again, if you're feeling overwhelmed and want to be alone, too bad. You always need to make sure you're at his side, giving into his demands because it's always his needs before the woman's. That twinge of jealousy or frustration When Jed would come home requesting for some time to himself after a long day at work and my thoughts immediately raced to, you got to work alone and interact with coherent adults all day. Like, why on earth would you need a break right now? Like, don't you understand that I need a break too? I would allow my selfishness to override compassion and understanding for my husband. When parenting becomes a competition on who's got it worse, that's a huge problem. So here's my challenge to you. 
Do the exact opposite of what you have convinced yourself you absolutely need in that moment or what your flesh has convinced you of. For me, in the most recent months, I have tried, this does not happen every day, I do not do this perfectly, I've tried to give Jed ample time to recoup after coming home from work, no matter the hard day that I've had. And I had never considered that pushing through even when I'm convinced I've reached max capacity, an extra, you know, 30 minutes of taking care of the kids alone, another hug after being touched all day, et cetera, et cetera, that it would be the perfect catalyst. And it's interesting because when they said that, I was like, okay, that's taken a real turn for the worse. So even in your own home, when you're being a good homemaker, you're still not doing enough ever. I'm like, when do you get a rest to recharge? Oh, they don't believe in rest. Now, don't get me wrong. There is wisdom in being able to get away from time to time in order to replenish spiritually, emotionally, and physically. But I really do think we have taken advantage as mothers of that part of scripture. Hmm. So some things to ask yourself that may help. Are you taking... Like, seriously, they don't. Like, I think they knew this kind of take was not popular even among their circles, so they just have an answer for that. Cherry pick from to suit our own tastes and desires. So, lean into it, embrace it fully, be sanctified, and lose yourself in the great calling of motherhood. The weight is a blessing, not a curse, and your life on this earth will be very rich that's all I have to say. Amen, sister. That's really good. I cried like three times while you were talking. <laughs> <clears throat> I was like, yeah, we pulled together. <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm just so proud of her. My little sister. <laughs> and I was like, don't interrupt her. Don't interrupt her. <laughs> anyway, um, that's all really, 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 really good. And honestly, like that does all of that doesn't even just ap- apply to mothers. Like, no, I feel it like, doesn't. I feel like I, I'm thankful that you, you know, you're highlighting that because the majority of our listeners are mothers, yes. you know, and that these are common temptations from, from mothers specifically. Yeah. yeah. But, <clears throat> excuse me, um, just even thinking about, like, how looked down it is, like, I was, I, I don't know what it was, but somehow I found something popped up on my page, like stay at home wife hashtag, like on, on my for like, you page Instagram? on TikTok. Oh, on TikTok. Okay. And I was like, that's weird. I've never seen that tag before. So I uh-huh. like, clicked it and was watching all these videos. And if you're still having doubts, any woman could be happy being a stay at home mom. They just don't realize it yet. I'm just like, what are we teaching our daughters mm-hmm. that like, it is not, it's not good enough work. It's not fulfilling work to be home yeah and it's and i hear people say like i just don't know what i would do at home and i'm like when i'm at home if you're boring just say that (laughs) (laughs) it's so funny like when i'm home all day and i'm not working my whole day is full yeah like it is full from the moment i Uh wake up and when i believe it and so it's like and we don't have a child. I don't know what I mean. We have an apartment. We don't even have a big yeah. house. And you want, and you, once you do, like you won't, it'll just be like replacing things on that list. But the exactly. list never dies. Like it yeah. never shortens. Yeah. Like there's <laughs> always something to be done yeah. if you're stewarding your household yeah. correctly. So yeah. I don't know. It, it's just like wild thinking about just how we're just fed lies. So, yeah. so, so subconsciously. Absolutely. Like nobody has looked me in the face and told me like, Why are you not working full time? So again, it's fine to feel lost. It's fine to feel you have no identity. It's fine to not know what your needs are or fulfill your needs or even be in tune with your needs at all. And you shouldn't have a moment to yourself, even in your own home, even to rest to be a good homemaker. Overworking yourself for your husband is the best thing for you. The next video is on biblical submission. I mean, all of their videos are on biblical submission, but this is the one titled that. Again, they they as wives are just so hard on themselves. They say, what if I sinned against my husband? To make sure that I am doing my duty as a submissive wife because <laughs> I have not been a good girl lately. <laughs> I have been, I have sinned against my husband in more ways than one in the past couple of weeks. And so, I have accountability right now. So I'm coming from a place right now of vulnerability of humility. <laughs> of like of truly like Gabby, you need to remind yourself these things. These are the truths of scripture. Yeah. It's so interesting. We can know so much with our head, all of the right things. And I can tell you everything that is right. And when we are done tonight, I could a thousand percent sin against Ryan the second Marcel leaves. Yeah. And so I'm not coming from a place of like, 
I am this perfect submissive wife with a quiet and meek spirit. That is not what I am now, but I pray that the Lord would give me all the grace in the world that he would sanctify me and orient my life to the scriptures that I would become that woman every day closer and closer so that I can help other women to to orient their their lives to the scriptures. And so I just kind of want to get that no, that's good. Pre- preface that's out good. of the way. <laughs> yeah, that's good. And um, most of this, I'm going to be talking a lot because I did make this outline, but Marcella is free to like no sympathy at all. The, the Christian wife has to give her husband sympathy and as much leeway as possible. But for themselves, never. They're definitely not the kind of people that say, it's wine o'clock. This clip worried me because, well, I'll just play it. But the wife does. So um, I think that it from those passages, we can see that this is a God-given duty and there is not this is not an option for us. We are not our own. There is a biblical hierarchy of a chain of command in the family. And it, it requires wives to submit to their own husbands. Now, does this mean that I'm su- supposed to submit to your husband, Marcella? No. No, I'm not supposed to submit to your own husband. Our husbands, <clears throat> our husbands are the people that we ultimately, we, we answer to <clears throat> and that we submit directly to them. It's not all men. I don't submit to all yeah. men. Yeah, yeah. Um, But as we submit to our husbands, we also submit solely to Christ and to our church authority. So there are men that I do submit to in my church, in my church authority. But also, those are the same men that my husband also submits to. Mm -hmm. So my husband and I both submit to our church authority and likewise to Christ. And so anything that we do when we are submitting to our husbands or submitting to... I just get so worried when they mention that because a woman is not her own, but a man is. And they're saying this as like an empowering statement as in, hey, the woman always is going to have agency over her own behavior no matter what, but a man's not always going to. So if he loses control, it's not that big a deal. But if she can control herself in a crisis situation, she's more honorable than if a man does it. So a man is kind of relieved from having that responsibility. And again, their answer to this is the wife submits to the husband, but the husband submits to the church authority. So he's being kept in check by the church, not you. I'm like, yeah, and the church is going to dismiss him more than a woman's sins. And even if the husband is outright a bad person, eh, it doesn't matter. Submit to him anyway. Because it's God's word. And apparently God just doesn't believe in hypocrisy or double standards. Oh, and they just later outright admit that a husband doesn't have to reciprocate any submission whatsoever. So as husband and wife, as equal heirs, you know, of the kingdom, that husbands have to submit to their wives too, because it says to one another. Paul is not talking about that verse in particular in a reciprocal sense. No. So it's not that everybody submits to everybody. No. He says that as like the preface and then goes on to list, here are the people, you yeah. know, in in your community or mm-hmm. whatever in kind of like the nuclear family setting or whatever. Yeah. And that's who they submit to. It's not everybody to. It's not just like nilly willy, willy nilly, nilly willy. <laughs> which, one, which one is it? Silly willy? <laughs> it's not just like everybody just submits to everybody that's not what he's talking about so know for yourself that's what that means and if you see other people saying that tell them that's not what that means (laughs) yeah and also there is hierarchy and and their logic for why there should be no reciprocation sins men commit are different than the ones women commit like how i don't know they don't explain but I'm going to tell you that it's this saying right here is why we have separation of church and state. And again, what breaks my heart is again, there's, there's, this is supposed to be about Christian marriages where the spouses should be both obeying Christian doctrine in a marriage. And I pretty sure there's a lot of passages in the Bible about the husband giving respect to the wife also, but they just are say, Hey, even if your husband isn't Christian or not a good Christian, it's no excuse anyway. And again, their lot answer to what I just said, that blatant hypocrisy is, well, the husband should be the one interpreting scripture anyway. So he gets the final say on what is a biblical Christian womanhood either. Mm-hmm. Because of what the episode in One by Her Conduct said, they mm-hmm. argued that it is the same. It is, you're, you're submitting to them 
in a whole different way with whole different strengths that the Lord has to give you and provides whole different things that you need. Mm -hmm. But it is still the same principles. Yeah. The scriptures are clear. It does not say you don't have to submit to your husband if he's not a Christian. Yeah. Okay. So you may be wondering, are Marcella and I oppressed? (laughs) Is there a gun to our head right now with, (laughs) is my husband... Is my husband the one that made this outline for me and told me this is what you are going to say? That is not the case. No. Again, we submit to our husbands, to Christ and to our church. Our husbands also submit to Christ and to our churches. Even our church authorities submit to governing bodies above them. Mm -hmm. So there is no, there's no way out of a submission relationship. Submission relationships are good. They are ordained by God. So by their own logic, the husband can say, it's in the Bible that I get to go and screw strippers and you have to put up with it. It's in the Bible, I said so. Doesn't this sound like abuse? It gets worse because again, when handling an issue with the husband, when the wife disagrees and can't just hold it back, it's best not to stand up for yourself They actually say, beg and plead. That works. It's better to plead. In all things. And so I want to quickly go over the cases where it is permissible to not submit to your husband and and to decline your husband. And he says this, first, that she be sure, being truly informed by God's word, that which she refuses to do at her husband's command is forbidden by God, sin. Secondly, that she first labors with all meekness and by all good means that she can do to persuade her husband to stop the origins and to and pressing that upon her, that which in good conscience she cannot do. So essentially what he's saying, if, you're, if your husband is asking you to do something that is very clear in scripture that it is a sin, the, this is what you ought to do. You ought to plead with him in meekness, that you should not do this thing, that you will not do this thing. If he's leading your family down sin, a sinful path, or he's asking you to do things that is clearly forbidden in scripture, we can plead with him. We do have that right to plead with him with kindness. And that we also have the right to firmly decline with a lot of kindness if necessary, does not give us the right to sin against them in turn and to be harsh with them. But we we still ought to be firm and say, no, I will not disobey my God. Um, and we also ought to pray and intercede for, to the Lord that the Lord would... Tr- and standing up for yourself to your husband is the curse of Eve. Most of the time it's going to be yes. It might not be to the degree as somebody else does, but every every woman has the curse of Eve. Since when did Eve ever want to dominate Adam? I don't remember that in the story. And, you know, even if your husband is making bad decisions like that Pat Robertson episode I referenced, it's fine that he fails because they're going to learn from their mistakes. And that's important. That's how they become a better man. It has to be my way. That is when the pride is sneaking in. And you know what? We have to allow our husbands to fail. Mm. You know, there's like some people that will say like, well, I just, I just don't want him to fail. I don't want him to, to mess up. I don't want, I don't want him. I just want him to do the right thing. Well, our job as help, as helpers is not to be the person that's like, well, I just don't want you to fail and mess up. It's to encourage them so that they don't, you know? And that's with like, that's with not giving them the benefit of the doubt either. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. It's like that's that's what the assumption that they're going to fail. And you really yeah. don't know yeah. what might happen or what may come out of a circumstance. And it's or so situation. interesting the times that I I thought like something this is not gonna work out. And like and I and I made the better choice to allow Ryan to lead us in that way. You know, it didn't it, it wasn't as bad as I thought it was gonna be. Mm. You know what I mean? And I hear so many people say like I just can't, I just, I just can't, I have to die. I'm like, okay, then die. Mm. It's not supposed to be easy. It's not- oh, but again, there's been so many videos and clips about how terrible it is if a woman makes a mistake also. Because the husbands are handling finances, their mistakes could be catastrophic. But of course, no one's holding them accountable for that. The husband's bad habits can just keep getting worse and worse and worse and worse. And they're just going to say, well, you know, it's for the better. He's going to learn. No, it's better. He needs to make these mistakes so he can learn to be a better husband. 
then okay, keep nope, keep letting him, keep letting him. Even if he makes you homeless, like they say, if you just act passive enough, passiveness will just become ingrained in your personality, and then you won't even have the urge to protest when your husband is creating a train wreck of your lives together. I just can't. I just. I just can't. I have to die. I'm like, okay, then die. Mm. It's not supposed to be easy. It's not supposed to feel good. Sometimes it literally means actually biting your tongue. Yeah. Because after a while, you won't have to bite your tongue as hard. It's going to be second nature. It's going to be easy for you to be like, I trust in my husband. Mm -hmm. I trust that he has our best interests as a family. I trust that he has... He has all these things worked out. And if he needs my help, he's going to ask me for help. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean that we have to shut up and not say anything. You know, obviously, like if we are his helpers, we want to be there to help, like delegate it. Like I want, I want to help you, you know, but if your husband has a vision for your family, it's not our job to come stomp in and say, well, I have all the answers because that's not displaying humility. And that's ultimately taking, taking the lead Mm -hmm. in the marriage. Yeah. Um, the next one is sincerity. And this one was really interesting um, when William Googe was talking about it in the book, doing things with real sincerity. And this is something that it, it was kind of uh, like a little uh, for me because <laughs> it's so interesting how I can do things like grumbling to myself and be like, well, he didn't hear me, you know, mm. or you know what I mean? Having bitterness against our husbands an inward bad attitude it doesn't even it doesn't even you don't have to say anything (laughs) yeah what i can't stand about them is apart from the bible and submission thing they say your husband should be the one who sets the standards of what is good and bad communication and they say women should communicate differently than the man but the problem is they also say a woman's way of communicating is well basically not at all see a lot of women being like well i guess that just means that yeah, I'm just not supposed to talk to my husband about anything because I can't say anything bad to him. And it's like, no, that's not what it means at all. But it it's means the way, have a heart check before. Yes, it's the <laughs> way you come at the conversation is is what we're getting at. Yeah. And I've also noticed like me throwing a fit to try to get my husband to help me. It never accomplishes anything. Yeah. Like <laughs> if anything, like he would help me, but I've squashed him mm. and I've taken the lead and I've and I've told him like, well, you have to do this because I can't and I'm not going to, Yeah, you know? And so at that point, it's, it's a much bigger issue. Yeah. And and don't just have a good attitude for the expectation of getting something back from him. Yeah. Because then that is being insincere. You're doing it to get, you know, well, if I'm just happy and cheerful and have a good attitude about it, then he's going to get up and help me or do all this stuff. It's like, no, you shouldn't have any expectations like that. You're doing it because you're working unto the Lord. Yes. And you're doing it with, <laughs> with a cheerful cheerful heart yeah. for your home and for your family. Not because it's like, not well, for if man's I, praise. Yeah. yeah. If I- so again, either try to bring it up in a genteel way that won't actually raise any alarms or influence the husband in any way. Or just make do with it because it'll somehow turn out for the better because of a myriad of reasons. Like, if the wife has a legit concern, come at it in the softest way possible so it barely seems like a concern at all. That, yeah, I'm just not supposed to talk to my husband about anything because I can't say anything bad to him. And it's like, no, that's not what it means at all. But it means have a heart check before. Yes, it's the (laughs) way you come at the conversation is, is what we're getting at. Yeah. And I've also noticed, like, me throwing a fit to try to get my husband to help me, it never accomplishes anything. Like, (laughs) if anything, like, he would help me, but I've squashed him. Mm. And I've taken the lead. And I've I've told him, like, well, you have to do this because I can't. And I'm not going to. Yeah. You know? And so at that point, it's... It's a much bigger issue. Yeah. You and, know? and don't just have a good attitude for the expectation of getting something back from him. Yeah. Because then that is being insincere. You're yeah. doing it to get, you know, well, if I'm just happy and cheerful and have a good attitude about it, then he's going to get up and help me or do all this stuff. It's like, no, you shouldn't have any expectations like that. You're doing it because you're working unto the Lord. Yes. And you're doing it with <laughs> with the truth. It sounds like torture, but they say a wife working herself to death is totally fine. Oh my gosh, I wasted my whole day on the internet, and then I use the last five minutes before he comes home to clean. Yeah. I'm like, that is literally the worst yeah. attitude to possibly have. And I'm, I'm, if you don't know me very well and we, you haven't been listening whoop, the, for that long, 
I have I work like 20 hours outside of the home and I still keep up the house for the most part, you know, and I have a chronic illness and I have a lot on my plate too. But the last thing I'm ever I ever want to do is is come home and put my feet up and be like, well, I am entitled now to rest and not to take care of my home because I worked. Mm. You know what I mean? Like then at that point, I shouldn't be working mm. at all. Because if, if that's the reason, if, yeah. yeah, if it's so that I can come home and be lazy and not do anything to take care of my home, then there is a there is an imbalance. Mm-hmm. OK. And also another thing with the perseverance, like this, the temptations to women is leaning into anxiety. Now, I've been very transparent before, and so is Marcella. Anxiety is real. We are not anxiety deniers. I've struggled with anxiety and panic for most of my young adult life, you know, since I was a teenager. And there is a way... She shouldn't even be allowed to have her own hobbies or like anything personal. ...relationship with Ryan and say like, it's so fun that you guys all have the same... You guys have the same hobbies. And it's like, you know what? I could really care less about baseball. (laughs) But like, you know what? Like, I love my husband and I love spending time with him. And I love watching baseball with him. I would never watch it by myself. But I love spending time with him. Mm -hmm. And we both have like little Dodgers jerseys now. And like, I love baseball now. You know, it's so crazy how the Lord will soften your heart, you know? Yeah. Even to like silly things like that. Meaningless things. You know? And then there's other more serious matters where it's like your husband. Okay. Like there was like, uh, I just to like speak from my own experience. I'm not making up any crazy wild things is that. Ryan and I had vastly different spiritual convictions when we were dating. Like, like not crazy, like not like gospel (laughs) issues, but like, just like real, like, like I was not like Ryan had been going to a reformed church for several years and was like settled. And if all that sounded terrible to you, well, it's feminists fault that this sounds bad, not theirs. Because in the next video, scaring women out of motherhood, they again, talk about how the modern world scares women out of motherhood and makes the trad wife life seem so unappealing. As we all know, they encourage getting married young, which feminists discourage. And saying the only time it's acceptable to be single is if you accept full-on celibacy. The gift of celibacy, which is, from what you're telling me, is not something that you would have because you wouldn't really have any desire. There's kind of like a supernatural inclination away from um, marriage and anything like that, you know, from any... Thing, like with the opposite sex or anything like that and I was like if you desire a family and marriage like you being single is not a gift it's uh it's a burden in your life because it's something that you desire and so I so then so she was commenting back and just telling me like well when you know when I do have a family like yeah family's important but like ministry should be the top priority mm. And I was like, that's like, that seems like a dichotomy, though, because you're saying, yeah, family's important, but ministry is more important. It's like, it's the same thing. They should be in the same category. Family is like your home. No wonder these people get married so young before they can explore careers and find things they love. Or anything like that. And I was like, if you desire a family and marriage, like you being single is not a gift. It's a, it's a burden in your life because it's something that you desire and so i so then so she was commenting back and just telling me like well when you know when i do have a family like yeah family's important but like ministry should be the top priority Mm. and i was like that's like that seems like a dichotomy though because you're saying yeah, family's important, but ministry is more important. It's like, it's the same thing. They should be in the same category. Family is like your home is your top, most important ministry yeah. that you're doing as as a woman. And so even in Christian circles, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of that like, oh, I got to go out and do this big thing for the Lord and like do all the mission stuff and you know, I have to be. Oh, and a Christian wife is never bitter and upset. Bitterness is not acceptable. This is really about our day to day life with our children. I think the passage I just read 
would allow us to answer with a resounding yes. There are no exceptions to bitterness. It is sin in all situations. Disciplining ourselves in our thought life is crucial. We are not going to be perfect at this tomorrow, but a long-term upward trajectory is certainly where the concept of toxic positivity originated from. In the last video I'm covering here, Embracing Radical Femininity, again, this kind of relates to the last video about singleness and how it's bad. The, any advice about delaying marriage is bad at all costs and should not even be considered. Said are so wrong. Mm -hmm. And so, okay, so for an example, delaying marriage for no reason. Okay, mm -hmm. so the, you know, we believe there's obvious reasons why you should delay marriage or maybe, you know, there's, there's obviously wise things. And, you know, if you're in a good church and you're getting good counsel, I'm sure there'll be people there say, oh yeah, you guys are ready to get married or you're not ready to mm -hmm. get married. But I do think there is an undue delay of marriage that has become so in accepted yeah. even in Christian circles. Yes. And so the opposite of that is getting married. And and considering marriage as an option young as well and not saying like, well, I need to I need to live my life before I get married and tie myself down. Secondly, um, abortion and the hatred of babies um, and the the hatred of motherhood, mm -hmm. even um, the answer to that is to embrace motherhood, to love children not just your own but other people's children so if your your home girl comes to you and says i'm pregnant you're like mm, like another baby you know like the, the worst and all concept of careers should just be sacrificed a career woman is is all that it is cracked up to be and this is coming from both of us have been career women completely career driven and i'm by by the time this episode comes out will be my last week as a career woman essentially wow, how fitting i know <laughs> so this is very fresh for me and i want to and want to make sure that i'm sensitive that i understand as somebody in the first four and a half years of my marriage worked most of the week and most of my day that sometimes you can't immediately do that when you first get married or you know, the sacrifices that you have to make in order to be a single income household is almost impossible. And so sometimes you have to have a secondary income. So I'm not going to speak to those nuances because we don't have time to go over every nuance. And even I thought for so long that I was a nuance because the Lord gifted me with the ability and the skills mm -hmm. to teach. And to they have a lot of content. I want to go through all of it because it fascinates me to no end. And I will do that in more parts. They cover a lot more topics. I just focused on relationships and what it means to have a Christian marriage. But there's a lot more to cover with these people. It's a complete iceberg rabbit hole, and I want to dive to the deepest depths.